And um, turn to page 178. 178. Once you get that, if you'll please stand, I'll open up in a word of prayer. Now, Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank for each and every one that's able to be here. We ask now for your blessings on our gathering, that you might be with us in a special way. Help us, O oh Lord, as we try to focus on you, as we sing hymns and, and begin to get into the word of God, that you would just draw us ever closer and draw us under the shadow of your wings. We ask now for those who are unable to be with us from sickness, work, or other uh, issues in life. We ask now for them, that you would uh, touch their hearts, touch their lives. And Lord, we thank you again for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 178, Bible stand.
turn back a few to page 148, please. 148. Will Jesus find us watching? If it touches the side, it will vibrate. Yeah, but there's something else now. Well, it won't be the plastic. Hmm. It's, um, but you do hear something else vibrating? Still here. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Open up your Bibles tonight to Second Peter. We will go back to where we left off. We had a little detour last week, but uh, no detour this week. And so we had stopped in verse thirteen, and verse thirteen says, "Shall we and shall we receive the reward of unrighteous? And shall we receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they counted a pleasure to write in the day?" Time uh, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you. Um, as I, I said again, you, you will find a lot of this uh, parroted over or very close to it in in Jude. Um, we had talked about the lake of fire and how death and hell is given up. We had, uh, I think, um, said it only. I'm pretty sure we said it only. Lake of fire was only used four times in Scripture. All of those are in. In Revelation, and uh, talked about how there was only one degree of torment in hell, but there are uh, varied levels of torment in the lake of fire. So now we, we're going on to uh, the next part of this, and, and it says, I shall receive a reward of unrighteousness. They shall receive. 
This is the promise. They shall. It is future. They shall receive. Um, this is the promise of reward for all those who continue in the path of sin. You know, we, we look forward to the day when we'll be in heaven. We look forward to the, being uh, glorifying our Savior and being rewarded by Him. And I think the biggest reward that anybody will ever get, getting to heaven, is getting that word of God when He says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't think you can top that. Um, you're in uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're in verse 13. Um, but I don't think you'll get a, I don't think there's any greater war, reward in heaven and earth than having God tell you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't care what kind of riches you can accumulate. I don't care what kind of riches there'll be in heaven. I don't think you'll ever get anything greater than the master of all the universe, creator of everything there is, telling you that statement. I think that is the ultimate uh, compliment. That is the ultimate reward. Uh, and I say that because his word is eternal. And once he says it, it's, it's confirmed for all eternity. And so if you don't get it, you understand the opposite. You have a condemnation on you if you would, even though you may be in heaven, if you don't get that, what it tells everybody else is you didn't do your best while you are here on earth. You were motivated by the wrong things. You were involved in the wrong things. Uh, we're not going to get into that. Uh, we're going to get into the promise of reward for those who continue in the path of sin. These are people who have refused to accept God's plan of salvation. It says, and they shall receive. God has provided a reward for the wicked who reject that reconciliation, that word of reconciliation. And then it, it says, um, it says, they shall receive the, the reward of unrighteousness. And then the next sentence is, as they, uh, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Um, uh, this group uh, that finds it a pleasure to riot in the daytime. Uh, my studies lead me to believe by the structure of this word that they are leaders in, in sinning. They're the chief of them that sin. They lust after evil that others would not bring into the light. They bring into the light. I mean, they, they take pleasure in doing their evil, their vile, their wicked deeds, and they like to do it in the light of the world. They don't, they don't, they're not hidden. They bring it out. And, and I, the, what's the first thing you think about when I say that? First thing I think about is the world today. <laughs> I mean, they boast and carry on. And Excuse me for a minute. I have... Um, I received an anointing, and I don't know where it come from. <laughs> no birds. So I don't know. This is, I don't know where it come from. Everything is just wet. Um, I think I got it there. Anyway, I, I yeah, it's kind of hilarious, isn't it? Maybe when I drank that water, I had a hole in my lip. I don't know. Y'all enjoying that? I got 101 of those, so anyway. As we're moving right along now. Is this being recorded? Anyway. Uh, let's, <laughs> a little late to ask that one, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> is it? Okay, let's... um. Hmm. Might be a blessing. And they shall receive uh, the reward of unrighteousness as they that count a pleasure to riot in the day. Now, this, the idea here of the, the word riot um, is a very interesting uh, word in my opinion. So I want to look at two words real quick. I'm not going to take long with it. But it says, and, and, as they that count it pleasure. Uh, the word pleasure is a desire for pleasure. Um, it is the, now you're going to love this. It is, and I'm going to pronounce this word in Greek. Um, Hedone. Hedone. What did you say? Hedonism. Hedon. That's right. Hedone. That's the Greek word. And that's the word from which we get hedonism. It's a desire for the pleasure of this world. Um, and, and the word riot, and you won't get this one, but the word riot is, is true faith. And, and this word is only used twice in the New Testament, right? The Greek word. And that the, last, the next time is here and then Luke 7.25. Um, but the idea is delicately. So these are people that seek after the pleasures of this world. 
but it's also pronounced del or has the idea or translated delicately. Like I said, it's only uh, used twice in, in New Testament, and it carries the idea of uh, to break up, uh, figuratively you could say to enfeeble, especially the mind or body by indulgence. Now that's kind of interesting. They seek the pleasures of this world, and those pleasures, um, they make them more feeble. They break up their strength, if you would. Um, riotous living in the day when men should work. Who does that? Think about it. Who is able to live for the pleasures of this world in the day? How about the rich? They don't have any certain times. They can do it. They won't. And, uh, how about in their day, the kings? This, um, uh, you know, I was thinking in, when I was going through this, I was thinking about uh, the things that we, we're seeing done today in the light. And just a few years back, people would have feared to practice. I would say 10 years ago, and maybe a little bit longer now, would have feared to practice such things in the sight of others. Yet today it's done with a, a boldness and a carefreeness. Um, by the way, this word riot could have, and it's defined as, so it could have been translated a little bit differently, but it is defined. This is the definition of the word they use, true faith. It's, uh, the definition is softness, effeminate, and luxurious living. I find that uh, when you think about that, um, we have begun to, and please forgive me when I say this, if it offends you, I don't think it will, but we live in a time when everybody's entitled. Everybody's entitled. And, and as I look at this, I see um, men becoming more effeminate. I think there's a softness. You can't take a little rebuke. Anything that's said is gets under your skin and you get mad. Um, I think some of this comes from entitlement. You, you begin to give a person something over and over and over again, pretty soon they begin to demand more. You know, you can't say that. It's an, go ahead. And when your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Oh, well, yeah. It's, it, it's kind of amazing when you, if you go down that line of thinking that if, I'm, if what you say is true, but I say something contradictory and what I say is true, um, there's a problem in there. And I don't understand how they can even go with that. I think the liberals today, um, and, and I would look at liberals a little bit different than Canadians would because of the political background we have. But when I think of liberals today, I think of people, what they say is right, but anybody else that defines that or defies them is totally wrong, don't know what they're talking about. There was a uh, high school student in the UK, I would just um, listen to her tell how, in fact, she recorded the conversation with her teacher who got on her because she told a student that she was not a cat. The student identified as a cat, and when this girl said, well, you're not a cat, I'm not going to say it. Anyway, I'm not going to say it. I am very tempted to say a few things on that, but I will not say it today. Um, basically, there are men indulging, these men here that they're talking about, these people, if you would, are indulging in their sinful nature, and they're doing it with an abandonment. They're doing it with a shamelessness. Uh, and God says judgment will come. You know, we live in a world today, to be honest with you, I listen to, to I have gotten into the habit here, um, not too long ago, uh, Ben Shapiro. Now, I don't, I don't believe everything he says. He is an Orthodox Jew, and I, I believe he's right on a lot of things. But I, I will not put out a blanket statement that I say I believe everything he says. Michael Knowles, there's, there's a couple others. But I listen to some of them's podcast every now and then just to try to pick it up. I don't pay for any of these things. I try to pick up uh, free stuff. I'm cheap. Anyway, but... um. I listen to their arguments and I weigh those arguments in the light of the Word of God and I listen to the ones that are arguing against them. And I find that they, they do have a lot of validity on their side. There's some times when I would say, well, you know, I may not have worded it like that, 
but I haven't listened to everything they say, so I can't say I'm 100% in agreement with them. I don't know that I'd be 100% in agreement with anybody. But the point I'm trying to make is some of the things that they're standing against and arguing with, um, you know, there would have been a time not so many years ago, when I say not so many, within, I'd say within 50 to 100 years, probably within 100 years, people like that would have been taken and stoned. Uh, we would not have tolerated it. It just wouldn't have happened. So how does this happen? How does it come, how does it come into society? Well, i tell you exactly how it comes into society. We allow those people to be the teachers. You know, teaching has is, is never been a, a highly glorified spot. You know, if you think about it, you, you're paid very little and you have all these papers to grade. So you have tons of time and you have to invest. You really have to love it. To be a good teacher, you really have to love it. And I'll take that and, and put that with pastoring or, or policemen or a grocery store attendant. Whatever you want to do. If you're really going to be good, you got to love it. But there are people that do it in there to push their agenda. They do it for money or they do it for whatever. Uh, but they do it for the wrong reasons. And I think what we've allowed is over time we've allowed these people to come in and, be, and, and take over. And then we've, they've laid a foundation. That foundation now, let me just do it a different way. They planted a seed. That seed sprouted and they watered and it's grown. And now that's what we have. We have a full-blown epidemic on our hands. And by the way, uh, it's the Christian that's living for God that's standing between them and, and, and the pits of hell. If we don't stand, then, then there's nothing to stop. You know, it's like that priest, um, Eleazar, that took the censer and stood between the living and the dead in, in Moses' day. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, unfortunately, these people have also crept into the church. And I think this makes allusion to this. Uh, spots they are, blemishes, sporting themselves um, while they feast with you. Well, I would think the feast would probably be the Lord's Supper or, or some type of fellowship. I, I really can't tell you right out. But my mind always goes back to the Lord's Supper when they say that feast. But it could. there were other feasts in the Jewish uh, people um, uh, that they may have brought into the church. But these, these uh, types are spots, like spots on a piece of uh, clean clothing. Um, they're a reproach to the name of God. They're a reproach to the name of Christ. You know, turn to, turn to Jude real quick. Um, and that's just a few pages over, uh, really, it's not that far. So we have Jude, and look in, start in verse 10. And this is really, we can, uh, we could go further back. Uh, actually, you could take the whole, the whole book. The book is really good for this. But verse 10, it starts off, But these speak evil of things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast. And those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They've ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kore. These are spots in your feast of charity. Love feast, basically. Uh, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. These are people, you know, imagine people coming into you and you're having a Lord's Supper in your church. They know they're not saved, yet they're willingly partake of that Lord's Supper. And they don't worry about it. It's just a piece of cracker, just... No, that may be what it look like, but that is a very sacred time in the eyes of God. We don't truly, as men, understand the full weight of that, but you will one day. That's a very, very sacred time. So they feast, they feed themselves without fear. There are clouds, they are without water. What are, what are clouds without water? Clouds carry moisture. And you're looking at Israel in hard, dry times. They, they have a promise of relief. They have a promise of a blessing, and yet there's nothing there. Clouds without water. Now look what it says after that. They're carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth. When that, that tree has its uh, flowers, and then it brings forth that brute, fruit, there is, a, there is an anticipation of a fruit, of a blessing coming. And then it says the fruit withereth. And then it says twice dead and plucked up by the roots. They're nothing. Absolutely nothing. These people that look like so much, when they come in here and they come into churches and, and they look like they're going to be a blessing, they look like they're going to be on fire for God and they're just, they're not even saved. They, what do they do? What do people like that do? They, they actually destroy the unity. Yes, they cause dissension, division, chaos, division. Oh, they just... 
and, and, and the frustration the, the, the just, just destroys the heart of the church. If you let it go, look at 13. It says, raging waves of the sea. You know, these people, when, you have, when they, something happens and they don't like, they rage. You know, I see some smiles. They just rage. And, and, and honestly, they rage about things that people who are walking with God look at them and think, well, we know they're not saved. We know they're not right with God. But in their own minds, oh boy, get into that's a whole new topic. I could preach on that. But in their own minds, you know, they're thinking that they're right, they're, they're godly, they're all, but they foam out their own shame. And then it says they're wandering stars whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Huh? Well, go back to the first words of it. Wandering stars. Stars are supposed to produce their own light. <laughs> but they're wandering in, dark, in blackness of darkness. These people have no clue. Spiritually dead, dead, dead. You know, um, there's a, there, I could get into a little bit of that about those stars. I, I really am not because I, I would probably have to stop and, and take off and go. There's a lot there. There really is. But if you read, I love the book of Jude, by the way. That is one of my most favorite books because there's so much in it. But they give us here a little bit more information uh, uh, to help us think about what Scripture is telling us about these men. I think as you get these other scriptures that, that add information, they add stuff that are, are, are more that you didn't have in that one, they basically um, give us a way or, or enough knowledge that we can balance out. Um, uh, you know, the truth is, these people today are in our church members. We have these type of people in our church membership. And they fellowship and they sit among us in our services and they claim to be a true child of God. They claim to, to want to do things uh, with the right motives. And, and yet the Lord says these are people that are not. That's not why they're here. Uh, you, what is your motive for being in church? You know, is it to glorify God? Or is it just to be here to, you know, I want people to think I'm a Christian. Or, you know, well, you know, I've had people tell me, well, I come to the church to straighten out the pastor. <sighs> They're not here now. I like what Al, um, there was a man run fish camp. His name was Al. I can't remember the other boy's name. They had uh, done some halibut fishing in Alaska, and they made some money, and they come back and bought a fish camp on, on the lake. And um, uh, Whatever happened, I forget this other boy, he ended up selling out to Al. And they had a fish camp as a place where you could... Um, you could set up a tent, you could pull in a trailer, but basically it was a place where you could eat and you could load your boat into the water or unload your boat, go fishing. That's basically the idea. Um, most of the time we call them landings, but some of them would name the place fish camp. But I remember Al had, had uh, hired a man by the name of Qualabom to come in there and uh, uh, be the cook in the kitchen. And, and it went pretty good for a little while, but Al was known to be temperamental. He didn't, you know, you, 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 as long as you were good, Al was good to you, but you could mess up and Al didn't play. I mean, he would throw the law on you. And, uh, and when I say that, he was a very firm fellow. There was nothing wrong with him. And this other fellow was more of a, well, let's just say he was rough around the edges. I don't want to get any more harder than that. But anyway, they got in an argument one day, and the fellow began to talk, call a bum, began to tell Al, the owner of the place, what was going to happen there. He began to tell him exactly how things were going to work because this is what he was telling him. And Al said, you know, I'm, I think we got some confusion here. He says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to fire you. And in the morning when I walk in here, I'll know who's boss. <laughs> Who do you think is boss? <laughs> I guarantee it was all worked out in the morning. And I think the man got off lucky knowing Al, I'll be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are people that, that like to, uh, they like to come and, and run the show. And, and for the most part, if they're godly people, I love to see them come in and have ministry. There are lines that you've got to be careful with, but I think for the most part, I have no problem. But when somebody claims to be a child of God and they begin to sow discord, now that's a whole new ball game. Um, these people were spots. 
What is, what's the thing about if, if, if I come in here after eating and I got a big greasy... Oh, there it is. No, no. no, if I got a big greasy spot on my shirt, what's the first thing you see? The it's the spot. And why do you see that spot? Because it doesn't match, match with the rest. It's different. What are the, one of the things I say when people join? Remember, we're not joining you, you're joining us. You're not to be a spot. You're to be a part of us. You're to get in and, and grain in. Um, uh, when you come to Canada, there were people here. Uh, Vera and I are a perfect example. We're not Canadians. We come to Canada. But we, I don't come in here and I'm an American. We could do it this way. Not going to happen. We're in Canada. We need to do it the Canadian way. This needs to be a Canadian church, not American church. We need to blend in. There's a thing called culture shock. And, and where you, the, the cultures are so different where you struggle. Struggle's not wrong. But be sure that you're not trying to stand out and be a spot. Be sure that you're trying to do. And the only way that you're going to do right is if you're doing it for God. But these people, they were a disgrace not only to the church but also to society as whole. When these people become a spot, um, there is... There, there, some people just love conflict. Some people just, just thrive on conflict. Uh, they got to argue with everybody. they got to have the lights on them. Um, I think when, what they're telling us here when it says they have um, pleasure to ride in the day, they, they, love that, they, they love that reveille and, and to boast in it. They want people to see it. That was their, you know, that's the way we are. Um, I feel like this matches when our, in our day and age. I don't think we're no, that for a majority, most people are, are modest, humble people. Now, I'm going to meddle for a minute, okay? I don't think I'm going to step on anybody's toes in here today, but um, the things I see women wear today kill me. They really do. They kill me. And, and, and I'm not talking about just any woman on the street. That's bad enough. But I'm talking about Christian women. Uh, I see Christian women coming into the church wearing yoga pants, you know, and I'm thinking, where did you get them Satan pants from, you know? Why are you wearing that in the church? I, and trust me, I've seen this. Um, um, when I look at these things, you know, that doesn't tell me that person's godly. For me, let me be quite honest, that's a spot. <laughs> I mean, that's sticking out like I just took my hammer and knocked my thumb two or three times. Um, uh, they wear them in public, which is, they should not. They shouldn't be outside the house, but they also they wear them in church. Um, and and they, they flaunt it, you know. Um, probably the younger the more, but I, I see people that, that they seem like they flaunt it and they're older. And, anyway, um, what are they doing? They're drawing attention to themselves. Mm -hmm, they are. And what happens when it's somebody that claims to be a Christian doing that? Oh, that's a Christian. That's what they wear. Oh boy, it taints their testimony. It taints the testimony of Christ. It it it, it really it 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 convolutes, if you would. It distorts what a Christian really is, what they stand for, and then it, all that. Then the testimony of the church, if they they tell them that they're for a church. So it's not just them they're affecting. And the people say, I can dress any way I want. Well, you know, I agree. If you're inside your house, <laughs> that's. Now, I'm going to qualify with that. You can dress any way you want inside your house. You know what? I can dress any way I want inside mine. But when I come out of that door, it's a different ball game. You know? How would you like it? Boy, I'm going to paint a picture that's going to mar you. I don't know if I want to do this. I'm going to do it anyway. What would you think if I come to preach in yoga pants? <laughs> that hurts, don't it? It already gives me a headache just thinking of it. Everybody close your eyes, kneel down, let's pray. <laughs> you understand what I'm telling you, though? The picture you just got, am I any different from you? I'm still a member of this church. I'm still a Christian, you know? Yeah, it does matter. And so that's, you know, I, when I first got saved, I would have shot the man that made these. I would. I hate these things. Well, I hated them. I have learned to 
to, to wear them and not, it doesn't bother me anymore. But boy, there was a time I struggled with that. You know, I had to cut my hair. Shoot, I didn't like cutting my hair this short. Don't bother me anymore. But you, you understand what I'm saying? You know, when you become a child of God, there's some changes you get to make in your life. You're not to be a spot no more. It says here, they were spots and blemishes. They were blemishes. You know, they're shameless. They're full of deception. They lead others into a life of sin and death because they proclaim one thing, but actually they're living for, for the devil. And people see them. You know, that's the thing about humans. I don't know if you've caught the, on to this, but you can tell a, uh, another person, say, I'm a Christian, and they accept what you say, and you can live like the devil. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, people tell me, he says, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a Baptist. And I said, really? I said, before we get into that, before I say I believe you, answer me a few questions. Do you believe in baptismal regeneration? you think you can be baptized and wash away your sins? Yeah, well, you're not a Baptist. <laughs> I mean, boom, first off, you understand. Your doctrines determine what you are. When you're not dressing right, you're not acting right, you're not what, what a child of God should be. And there's a good possibility you're not a child of God. And I think, I think, well, let me say this and, and try to qualify it. I believe God has a dress code. I believe the church has a dress code or the body of Christ, if you would. There are things that you should not wear in church. There are things that you should wear if you're coming, uh, trying to come before God and worship. But with that said, understanding there is a manner in which you should come to God, not only in attitude, but in dress to worship. With that said, I don't run a military organization. So you're not going to have me running around behind you telling you this, this, I'm, I'm not going to do it. You'll never find me doing that. That's not my job. Remember how I told you you had a teacher? Who's that teacher? He teaches you. But if you don't think I won't pray for him to get on you, you're wrong. <laughs> You're sadly mistaken if you don't think I won't fast and pray and ask him, get on that one. You know, because he needs to. Does he not? He needs to get on me sometime too, you know. And you need to be praying the same thing if you see something. Now with that said, again, there are immature in Christ that have not grown. You have the newly saved in Christ. Um, you have unbelievers that come haven't been coming to church long or somebody's inviting them. That's why I don't say anything in church too much. Because these are people you don't want to offend. You want them to hear the Word of God. So you accept them the way they are. But at the same time, you're looking for God to do a work in their heart and change them. But if it's somebody who's been coming for and claiming to be saved, that's a whole different ballgame. They fall out into another category. Um, I think, and I'll put it this way, I think if they're immature, haven't been saved long, or, or um, uh, uh, just been saved, I think God winks at those things because he knows they don't know. He knows they've not grown to a place where they would understand those things. And so I, and the term is, is used in the Bible. I think he um, will accept less from them because they don't know any better. But he does still expect them to grow as a child of God. And he gave that Holy Spirit to guide us. So anyway, I just close on this uh, one verse by saying this. These uh, types of people are really invited into churches today unhindered. You know, there's a lot of churches that would have these people in because they have money, because they, um, you know, they're, they're notable. They're, you know, the, you know they, oh yeah, if we had them in our church, everybody would be coming to our church, you know. And it's like the church was in and, and they talked about the singers and, and they talked about how good they were. I said, well, what did they sing? They said, well, you might know this song, 40 Weight Gravy. I said, no. I can tell you about the name of that one. They're not going to sing that in any church I go to. 40 Weight Gravy? Do you remember that? Boy, that, I, I never got over that. I didn't ask anymore. It was Grandma's 40 Way Gravy, and that's one of the songs they did. And I was like, well, in church. in church. Well, you know, people say a lot of things are worship that's not. But yeah, that was an eye opener for us. I was like, 
I won't go into the rest of the testimony they left for us, but anyway. I think these are people uh, we try to reach, but there comes a day when they continually reject the Word of God. We separate ourselves from them um, or either become corrupted by them. Uh, but there should not be a time when we stand before God where it could be said that we did not try to reach them. We try to reach them. We do. But we have to be careful in that. You can't risk your purity or your testimony for anyone that's going to continually reject the Word of God. You've got to be very careful there. Um, 14. i got a few minutes. Well, maybe I don't. Never mind. Um, oh, i got time to read it, and that's it. So we're going to leave it right there. We'll come back on 14. Uh, does anybody have any questions or anything? Yes, sir. Um, it's interesting what you were just talking about because I saw a little clip. Uh, I guess it was a question and answer with a, a pastor. And someone asked them, what authority do you have over your congregation or people? And he says, I don't have any. And the way he answered it, I thought was good. And he says, the authority comes from the Word of God. You know? And if a person wants to go to the pastor and ask advice, that's one thing. Or if they want to ask the pastor, what does the Word of God say? And then the pastor can tell them. But I thought that was good the way he said that I... I don't tell people what to do. I don't tell them all this. That is a really good question. What authority does the pastor have? I will say this. Um, I believe I'm called of God to be here. So that calling is the authority of God to be here, to preach and teach the Word of God. Um, when it comes to uh, telling people what to do. Now, I do have, I do have, uh, or have been under ministries where the, the preacher does this. Tries to tell you what to tithe, tries to tell you what to do this, this, and that, and this. I think that's very dangerous. In that aspect, I agree totally. Um, there was more to it. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, in, in that aspect, I would, I would totally agree. Um, I am not uh, the authority, because there are a lot of people who like to lift themselves up as the authority. In, and I think I've made this plain. This is the real authority. The, everything has to come out of here. If I say something and it's not biblical, then I'm wrong. This is the authority. It's the Word of God. And I, I pressed the other day, um, talking about the, the leading of the Spirit and, and the Holy Ghost uh, teaching you. Um, I can teach. I can do what God has, has laid on my heart and I can uh, give you lessons. But in the end... It's the Spirit of God that's really got to apply it to your heart. Um, uh, there's some things I could go in now that's really been breaking my heart lately um, here. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. But I can say this. Until the Spirit of God gets a hold of a heart and begins to implant in them the necessity to spend time every day and puts that desire in there, then they're going to be like spots in a way. Not all of them. Um, they may have the spots that you don't see, but some of them will be real pronounced. But it's the Spirit of God that changes that. He saves them. He grows them. He refines them. It's the Spirit of God that does all that. What we do as preachers and teachers is God has given us the authority. He's placed us. I am uh, the overseer, and I am the one that when I stand before God, I'll have to answer for what I've taught you. Yeah, I, I'm the one, and the scripture tells us that I have watched for your souls. And so, yeah, you, I have all of you on a prayer list. And yeah, I pray for you, and I have specific things that I can see that God has shown me that I need to pray for you. Um, but in the end, God's got to get a hold of the hearts. You know, The more we give our hearts to Him, the closer we walk with Him, the stronger we'll be. And the, the more we'll accomplish for him. And so, yeah. So, yeah, basically I do agree uh, but with those qualifiers. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just thinking, um, people that, who, who know better and don't dress appropriately when they come to church or come to worship the king, um, if they were going to visit the queen, 
You know, I just got in a conversation with somebody the other day, and they talked about being able to wear anything to church. I said, that's true, you can. I said, let me ask you this question, though. I said, if you were going, knew you was going to meet somebody real important, like Trudeau. I said, well, you may not like Trudeau, but let's just say somebody you thought a lot of, you know. And would you dress up or would you go like that? And they said, well, phew, I put on my best. I said, then you should do no less for God. What they're telling you when they don't is they have no respect for God. There was a pastor in one of the churches that we worshipped in who would always show up in jeans and a golf shirt until one Sunday he came in a three-piece suit. He was out. He really looked sharp. I said, wow, that's really great. I like that nice suit. He looked really sharp. He says, well, I'm, in, I'm meeting an important client after church. Did you spit on him? And it makes you wonder myself when it, so you'll, yeah. makes me wonder if he's even saved. You know, or he's just a hireling. I don't know. That's you know. I honestly um I wouldn't be here if the Lord hadn't placed me here. I, I really wouldn't. Um but yeah. Praise the Lord for um for people whom he's called and and, and People who, who understand the value of, of worship and what it means to come before the King of Kings and spend time with him and other uh, people in fellowship that, that love him. Um, it is a, it's, it's, a, it's a thing today that we see that's a real burden on, in Christianity. So, all right, anybody else want to comment? All right, then let's go ahead and, and turn to page, uh, I think it's 366. Uh, we'll sing and cut it off then. 366. This is one that we have been learning. And, um, I want to uh, continue. I thought it was a good song to close with. You know? It says, uh, Give me thy heart. So 366, if you'd like to stand, please.
you see that.